Welcome to our Clean Electric Bus Application Webinar. We look forward to sharing information on how schools can apply for clean electric bus matching funds, uh, why Florida's kids need a just transition from uh, dirty fossil fuel based buses to uh, clean, uh, clean electric vehicles and the many benefits that it can provide both to school districts, to the health of students, and to um, the schools themselves, um, as well as uh, providing some background on how this program has emerged, the Volkswagen settlement, which uh, provides the funds that uh, back it, as well as uh, some details regarding uh, grant procurement and uh, Florida uh, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection's uh, overall program. This webinar will be recorded and the audience members can ask questions throughout the presentation using the chat feature. We will answer any other questions at the end. Uh, but first, let's do some brief introductions. My name is Zach Cosner. I'm the Climate and Clean Energy Advocate for Florida Conservation Voters. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Maria. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maria Revelles. I'm the pro program director for Florida Conservation Voters, Chispa Florida. And we are also joined today by Hastings Reed of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Yeah, my, my name is Hastings Reed uh, with Florida DEP. I'm the deputy director of the Division of Air Resource Management. Um, and we are uh, the people who will be implementing the Volkswagen settlement through the Florida Beneficiary Mitigation Plan. Well, thank you. So um, I think we'll start our presentation now. So Carson, if you go to the next slide. So that would be me, right? Uh, well, first, I was going to provide a little bit of context on the history of the program, the Volkswagen Settlement. Awesome. So um, in September of 2015, it was discovered by the Environmental Protection Agency that uh, Volkswagen executives had installed a defeat device in 590,000 uh, Volkswagen uh, personal passenger vehicles sold in the United States and specifically billed as low emissions vehicles. Um, these, this defeat device essentially was a uh, sophisticated piece of software which kicked in during, uh, was able to recognize uh, when the uh, vehicles were being tested, uh, kicked in during testing and uh, essentially shut down and essentially uh, caused the uh, vehicles to have a display much lower emissions than they actually had. Um, these vehicles emitted nitrogen oxide at rates upward of 38 times the legal US maximum um, when it, they were discovered. Uh, after that, there was a series of uh, lawsuits against the company by EPA and the Federal Trade Commission. And in October through May of 2017, uh, October 2016 through May of 2017, uh, Volkswagen was hit with a series of settlements, uh, which ultimately cost them $14.9 uh, $4 billion, uh, 11 billion going towards uh, recalling the vehicles and modifying them. Uh, two billion towards the development of a zero emission vehicle infrastructure fund to be distributed throughout the states, and 2.9 billion to fully remediate the excess nitrogen oxide emissions uh, from the um, that uh, were emitted uh, under these false pretenses. Uh, Florida's share in this program of um, mitigation and uh, zero emission vehicle uh, promotion was $166 million to be distributed over 10 years. So basically, uh, when in 2008, Volkswagen was caught cheating uh, and the federal emission test, and now they're paying Florida $166 million as a result of the settlement. Where does we come from? Over the last two years, Florida Conservation Voters Education Fund which is the parent organization of CHISPA Florida, has amplified the voices of concerned parents and communities in demanding that the hundreds of millions of dollars our state is receiving from the Volkswagen settlement be used to upgrade our aging fleet of taxi diesel uh, school buses to zero emission electric buses. And after advocates launched a campaign to push the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to use funding from the settlement for new clean electric school buses, 
the state committed those funds to update school buses and fleets and to move school districts away from dirty uh, diesel buses. Along with these uh, voices, uh, uh, voices of our supporters, we also urge uh, Governor Ron DeSantis to focus on funding in low income communities and communities of color, which experience disproportionately high environmental burdens like poor air quality and high radius of asthma. Then the Florida Department of Environmental Protection recently announced that school districts, Florida, most polluted and most populous regions are eligible to apply for a $57 million to replace diesel fuel school buses with clean electric buses. Of the $166 million in funding allocated to Florida, 70% of funds will be allocated to school transit and shuttle bus upgrades. Funding for clean new buses is available in 23 school districts, and it's critical that counties like yours apply for the, prog for the match program. Do we have a slide two now? Yep. Okay, so the program is a great opportunity to upgrade your fleet and why go electric? We wanna go electric for cost, health and climate reasons. So there's a lot of ways in which um, you know, electric vehicles generally do uh, massively reduce the costs which uh, school districts incur on transportation. Um, the Argonne National Laboratory model uh, demonstrated that zero emission electric buses have a total cost ownership of 18% uh, lower than new diesel buses. Uh, if you can see the graphic, which we include in the slide, shows that the uh, costs of both maintenance and fueling are both significantly lower for clean electric buses than both natural gas and diesel buses. Uh, the only uh, thing which increases the price of uh, the electric vehicle uh, is the um, upfront cost associated with uh, purchasing the electric vehicle. Um, Bluebird uh, charging approximately 150,000 more for an electric type C or type D bus than their diesel variant. However, um, over time, in terms of maintenance, electric bus maintenance, including battery uh, replacement, is only approximately 70 cents per mile, whereas diesel bus maintenance is approximately $1 per mile. And fueling uh, costs uh, vary across the uh, different counties and your different um, utility. However, uh, the average diesel bus only gets about 6.25 miles per gallon uh, fuel. Um, electric vehicles can be charged much more cheaply uh, than uh, fueling a diesel bus. And EV buses being charged by the regionally generated electricity, um, it's both cheaper, but it's also much more stable in pricing. There's far fewer uh, fluctuations in terms of what you can expect to pay, and that can make for more effective budgeting. Um, a study that was conducted on a uh, you know, cost comparison between new diesel buses and electric buses that were integrated into a vehicle to grid system, which we don't yet have in Florida, but might be able to um, implement at some point in the future. Uh, they found that the um, vehicle to grid integrated electric buses uh, provided a, a net present value of approximately $6,000 per seat, uh, including the costs of refueling, the costs of maintenance, as well as the externalities associated with uh, diesel buses or eliminating those externalities. Those externalities being impacts to the health of children and the surrounding community, as well as the um, cost to the climate. So that's what our next slide will show. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, diesel school buses not only just contribute to global, global climate change, they also produce atmospheric pollution which can harm young children and contribute to breathing conditions such as asthma. And asthma is the leading cause of school absenteeism in children. Florida's children have the right to breathe clean air, but about 2.7 million of our children are exposed to toxins and known carcinogens that cause asthma, heart and lung disease, and cancer for riding dirty diesel uh, school buses. Electric school buses are safer, are cleaner, are cheaper long-term, and they produce zero emissions. And with so many children exposed to pollution, it is not coincidence that one in 10 children in Florida suffers for asthma and low-income communities of color disproportionately bear environmental burdens and are more likely to suffer from adverse environmental, um, environmental uh, health impacts. With your action today, we can provide a clean and fiscally responsible way to secure a healthy future for our children. 
underlying conditions such as, such as asthma are exacerbated by poor uh, air quality. COVID, which right now we're in the middle of, of a pandemic right now, and other health issues. According to Journal of Health Economics, school buses contribute disproportionately to ambient high air quality, and they pollute near schools and residential areas. The, this paper examines the impact of school buses, emissions reductions, programs on with health outcomes and a key contribution relative to the broader uh, aggregation. And we find that school bus retrofits induce reductions in bronchitis, asthma, and pneumonia incidence for at-risk populations. And we're talking specifically in black and brown communities. Diesel exhaust is harmful for everyone, but children are most at risk because they breathe at a faster rate than adults, meaning that they will breathe more toxins. According to a Harvard study, African Americans are about three times more likely to die from exposure to urban pollutants than any other racial groups in the United States. Children of color are going to be nine times more likely to have asthma than white children. And transition in school buses from, from diesel to electric will be immediate and a smart way to help increase public health, low income, and communities of colors. This transition will be a solid first step for communities that have been forced to bear the burden of increased pollution and systemic segregation. A growing number of, municip of municipalities are setting 100% renewable energy goals, including St. Petersburg, Tallahassee, Gainesville, Orlando, Sarasota, and South Miami Beach. And then finally, um, there are significant uh, reasons to go um, electric for uh, the uh, purpose of helping to maintain a livable climate on planet Earth. Uh, it should be no surprise that electric vehicles are have far, far fewer associated emissions than uh, their diesel counterparts. Uh, if you can see the um, life cycle warming, uh, uh, global warming emissions from different types of transit buses um, graphic at the bottom right corner, uh, you, the boldened uh, blue uh, bar there is the electric bus uh, taken with an average of uh, Florida counties in terms of their uh, average grid mix, you know, where they're um, coming from when they produce electricity centrally. Uh, you can see that compared to a diesel fuel bus, fueling via like uh, electric charging just simply has a much, much lower uh, associated CO2. Uh, Florida's average, uh, uh, with the Florida average of uh, grid mix, you'd see a 58% reduction in uh, CO2 emissions compared to diesel buses uh, via implementing an electric bus program. And, and uh, it is important to note that that is only likely to decrease further as uh, more and more uh, solar and renewable energy capacity comes online in the state of Florida. Uh, there's also a significant resilience element as well. I mentioned uh, programs such as vehicle to grid earlier. The way they're able to uh, function is that you know, school buses are able to hold up to 160 kilowatts of uh, stored energy, these electric buses. And you know, uh, that can be very, uh, very useful and very um, helpful in uh, the event of an emergency, uh, which might uh, cause uh, for the loss of power. And so uh, the development of a larger renewable energy uh, electric bus fleet uh, can have significant uh, re resilience impacts and significantly increase the capacity of a district to weather um, disruptions uh, associated with climate change. And with that, I think we'll pass it on to Hastings Reed to dis uh, describe the program that uh, DEP is operating. Zach, I appreciate that. So um, DEP's role, as I, as, as I said at the outset, is to implement the trust fund. Um, so Zach laid out the different elements of uh, Volkswagen settlement uh, very well. Um, of, this, of the 16 or so billion dollars, uh, a lot of that went to uh, uh, you know, buying back the cars. There's also a $2 billion electric vehicle infrastructure kind of uh, element to it. Um, that is being run by Volkswagen directly and uh, is already being implemented in things such as uh, through Electrify America, which is Volkswagen's uh, kind of electric, electric vehicle kind of arm. 
Um, and then the third element was the uh, 2.9 billion for states. And that was basically divided up by prorated how many uh, of the cars sold were sold in Florida. So Florida was about uh, uh, 8%, I believe, of the total amount of, of, of Volkswagen diesel cars that were sold. And so therefore, we got about 8% of the money, which equals $166 million. So that's where that number comes from. So consistent with that, we, we submitted all the paperwork we needed to become beneficiaries under that trust fund. And the first step under that program was to develop and submit to the trustee the Florida Beneficiary Mitigation Program. And that had certain requirements that we addressed, the types of uh, programs, you know, the, 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 trust, the trust agreement laid out 10 different eligible mitigation actions that you could choose from. Um, and the purpose of the mitigation plan is to lay out what the state was gonna do with that $166 million. So we had a robust public uh, in informational gathering process. We held public meetings uh, across the state in five different locations, I believe in, in 2017 or in 2018. Um, we had a, a survey that we encouraged people to apply for. I know there was many, many survey responses, including from people such as uh, yourselves. Um, and we took all that information and we ended up developing the final beneficiary mitigation plan, uh, which was submitted to the trustee uh, a little over a year ago. Um, that plan, which is available on our website, lays out our three main eligible mitigation actions that we are going to be using. Um, as Zach pointed out, we are going to be uh, using about 70% of that $166 million, which is about $116 million, uh, under the bus element. And that includes transit buses, school buses, and uh, uh, shuttle buses. Um, so that was our main priority. Um, and just to, for full disclosure, we also use the maximum 15% available for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, which will be used to put DC fast chargers along the interstate highway system in the, in the, in the state. Uh, we are off and running on that. Um, and actually our grant period closes on the same day. So uh, if, you, if you were thinking about that, you still have time to apply. Um, and then the other is using the remaining funds under the DIRA program uh, which can be used to clean up uh, aging diesel units um, to have much cleaner units through EPA's DIRA program. It's kind of a combined program between EPA's DIRA and the VW settlement. So we're here focused on, you know, that 70% portion. Um, so this is our first phase of that portion, this $57 million. This exhausts all the money that we have been appropriated so far uh, by the legislature's uh, by the legislature over the past few years. So the $57 million actually gets us to exactly halfway through our 166 um, when combined with those other programs. So, um, you know, we did announce a pilot program about a year ago and we had a great amount of interest. And so it was a very small pilot program. Uh, it was $5 million. Um, and it was just, you know, so many people raised their hand and said, we wanted to participate that we kind of went back to the drawing board and thought, how can we, meet the needs of all of these school districts um, in, in one effective program. So um, as you can see on this slide here, um, it was limited to priority areas. These priority areas were developed in the beneficiary mitigation program um, as, as identifying and satisfying the element that the trust agreement said that we consider how areas that have borne a disproportionate share of the air pollution burden. Um, now, <laughs> Being the deputy director of the Division of Air, it's important for me to always remind you that Florida does meet all the national ambient air quality standards. Um, and that's something that we, we, we achieved over many years. Um, and we are excited that in 2020, we finally achieved that goal. And now we have no non-attainment areas in the state. However, there are places that are disproportionately worse than others. They all meet the standards, but there are places where it's higher. Um, and so we used our ambient air quality data and emissions inventories to identify these locations. And not surprisingly, it's consistent with population density. Um, the largest source of nitrogen oxide emissions is from mobile sources, not stationary sources, which is most of what uh, the Division of Air regulates. We mostly regulate uh, stationary sources. Um, and so this was an opportunity to um, reduce emissions in an area where we don't you know, EPA sets mobile car standards, which was the genesis of this whole 
uh, lawsuit and everything. Uh, but this was an opportunity for DEP to uh, use uh, the carrot of this Volkswagen money to, to get emissions benefits associated from the transportation sector. So, so that's why these priority areas are in the way that you see them here. And so um, the $57 million, uh, the, there is a um, existing contract with the Department of Education for uh, two vendors, I believe at this stage. Uh, it may be an evolving thing over time, uh, but there are two approved vendors on DOE's uh, vendor uh, for buying school buses. Um, DEP is not involved in saying who an appropriate vendor is. If you don't use the approved, pre-approved vendors on D, uh, the Department of Education's list, um, you can procure um, other vendors um, so long as it's procured in a competitive process. Um, I would also note that DOE has other requirements of which you know, DEP is not involved regarding uh, safety and other issues um, that may not allow buses to be used for pupil transport. And that's something that we are aware of. And uh, you know, until um, a, a manufacturer of an electric bus meets those safety standards, it's unlikely that we would uh, enter into a grant agreement to purchase those types of buses because DOE wouldn't allow them to be used for pupil transport. Um, so these are mostly for class C, uh, type C and type D buses. Uh, those are the longer school buses. Um, you know, I believe for 75 or 88 pupils. Um, and um, so these are, are pretty large buses. They cost about you know, $300,000 and change once you include the associated infrastructure needed for charging. You know, I think it's a fair assessment to say it would be approaching $400,000 per bus to get this going. Now the department has said that we will uh, match up to 75%. Um, that 75% would cover approximately $300,000 of that $400,000 investment. Um, it does only focus on the buses themselves and the associated charging infrastructure. That is what it's eligible under the beneficiary mitigation uh, plan and the trust agreement, more importantly, because that really limits our discretion. So, um, a shorthand way of thinking about this is a new diesel bus costs about one hundred and fifteen, one hundred twenty thousand dollars. So you know, the a good way of thinking about this is if a school district wants to buy a new bus, um, DEP will provide the money, the incremental cost to turn it into an electric bus. Um, we think that with fifty-seven million dollars, uh, depending on the cost share. Now, I did say up to seventy-five percent. Uh, we are prioritizing school districts that are able to put together, put a little bit more money in. So if, if the school district says, we'll do a 70% cost match and we want this many buses, they will be prioritized. And that would allow uh, more buses to be purchased statewide. Um, I think I said it should buy about 200 buses total with, with the VW money. Um, you know, that is an estimate, um, but I think it'll be in that range. And um, so, Initially, we had a deadline in, in December. We did receive requests for extensions. We granted that extension. Um, so at present, the current deadline is, is, is exactly a week from today, uh, January 19th, to fill out our basically our application form. It, it's functionally a notice of intent to participate. Uh, you're not committing any, you know, you're not committed to buying buses if something happens. And we know that this is COVID time. We know that there have been uh, lots of uncertainties out there today. We just wanna get an idea of what uh, your level of interest is. And we will move forward with a grant development process and enter into an agreement that will specify what, uh, what you wanna purchase and, what, and how we will provide that money. Um, one important thing to note is that pursuant to these grant agreements, we are gonna be doing advanced grants. That's where we can send you the money that we have committed um, ahead of time. So this is not a reimbursement program. So you're not gonna spend $400,000 for a bus and a charger. And then when you receive it and get everything done, you get $300,000 know, a year later. Uh, we are gonna provide our share up front in order to uh, you know, provide that budget flexibility that school districts are, are very much likely to need. 
Um, so, so that's another thing. Um, so thank you, Zach, appreciate that. Uh, the applications, as I said, are kind of non-binding. We really want to get an idea of what you want to do. I think we have timing flexibilities. You know, um, if say a student says they would like 20 buses, 20 electric buses, uh, just to throw a number out there, um, they wouldn't have to purchase them all at the same time. So if they wanted to buy five in the, in the spring of this year and five next fall and five next spring, and five in the fall of 2021, if that's what they need to be able to make this be a successful program, um, that is uh, something that we will consider and would put into a grant agreement that specifies that type of process. Of course, we would send you the money once you're ready to purchase the bus. That's kind of the point that we would do then. So um, another important consideration, which is not really inside DEP's bailiwick, but important to note is that Electric buses do have some limitations that diesel buses don't have. Um, and you don't want to kind of uh, bite off more than you can chew in saying we want to have our whole fleet be electric buses um, and then find out that only 50% of your routes are uh, consistent with the use of an electric bus. So longer routes um, or uh, you know, less frequent charging or however the, uh, the people that run these programs we want to make sure that we put the bus to its best use, whatever that is. I think likely it's going to mean shorter routes. Um, this is an evolving technology. Batteries will get better over time. Um, but, you know, we need to make sure that we're not buying buses for a use for which they're not compatible for. And uh, another important consideration, um, this often gets lost in the, in, the, in the excitement about buying new buses, is that we do have to scrap the old buses. So this is a trust requirement. Um, there's really no ability to get out of this. Um, so it has to be an eligible bus under the trust agreement, which is, I believe, 1999 to 2009 age buses. Um, it's all specified on our website. Um, and what that means is that for each electric bus that you purchase, we have to scrap one existing eligible bus. Um, that would all be detailed in the trust agreement, uh, sorry, in the grant agreement between the department and the school board as to what those requirements are. We do have record keeping and reporting requirements. We would need, you know, pictures um, just from a high level. Uh, the, the scrappage requirements, scrappage is the term that's used in the trust, means that you have to cut the chassis of the bus in half and drill a three inch hole through the engine block. Thus permanently rendering it inoperable. So it's, <laughs> it's important to know that those are the requirements. Um, those are not set by DEP, that's the grant requirements uh, to scrap. So, um, but those are things that of course, uh, we would work through with our partners in making sure they understood what is required. And um, I think that's about all I had. So, you know, we're just encouraging people to apply. Um, I know that you may feel, um, like you're not sure what you're getting yourself into, um, but we do want to encourage that and have an opportunity to have the discussion um, in the grant development process um, to make sure that we do run a successful program um, and have the level of interest um, to, you know, you know, there will be future, uh, there's future um, appropriations to fund the Volkswagen program uh, in total. And a successful program here increases the likelihood that it'll be used more in the future too. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hastings. Uh, are there any questions from uh, members of the audience regarding this program, uh, the application, or just any other questions at all uh, for the team here or for Mr. Reed? I have a question. I think you might have already touched on it. Um, of the 166 that will be provided or that will be used, within that is things like, um, you know, charging stations, that kind of infrastructural type things for the buses. Will those be off school grounds as well, or will they be only on school grounds, just depending on routes and things like that? Okay, so just, just to be clear, the, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure element of our mitigation plan is about, you know, of charging electric cars use like normal cars, you know, like the Chevy Bolt and the things like that. 
the electric buses are going to have dedicated charging equipment for it at a school depot, a bus yard, or wherever it is, you know, T TBD. You know, you're going to have to work with uh, your local utility to make sure that the connection to the grid is enough to charge the number of buses that you want. There is an important kind of planning aspect here in that, you know, if you want to do uh, five electric buses, um, but you're like thinking, oh, that's our first step, you know, you, there's a lot of costs associated with building out that infrastructure and you don't want to suffer that cost every time you add five new buses. You want to plan ahead and say, you know, we're going to be going in this direction. And so you want to make sure the infrastructure is ready so that you don't have to continually go back and replace existing equipment that you just purchased to continue to expand the program. So a little bit of vision towards the future and where you want to be is important because, you know, every time you have construction crews come up and dig up uh, property for installing charging stations, you know, that's, that's money that, that, isn't coming back and it's important that it's put to its best use. Absolutely, thank you. So if we don't have any more questions, uh, but after we finish this conversation, you have additional questions or you want to reach out to CHISPA, to Florida Conservation Voters, please reach out to Zach or myself. Um, I believe that um, Carson is gonna drop our emails on the chat box. You are? Yep. So you can find us over there and you can uh, ask us questions about how to in include any uh, comments, how to reach out to any of us and any of the speakers or any of the, or any, any support that you need and you wanna follow up on where is the campaign going and how is the process going, please reach out to us so we can uh, continue this um, conversation. And thanks for joining us. And I think we are, um, finish for the day. Thanks for joining us today. All right, thank you.